Amen. Say this out loud. I'm a faith person. I go to a faith church. Faith overcomes the world. Hallelujah. But your faith works by love. Amen. Turn to Galatians chapter 5. We'll look at verse 6. Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. You know, in coming into the holiday season, coming into the Christmas season, my immediate attention <coughs> goes to, excuse me, <coughs> goes to our Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ and the fact that he loved us so much that he gave his life. How many of you know John three sixteen? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Come on, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. Amen. God loved you so much that he gave his very best. Amen. And so the Bible has a lot to say about love. So we share about love. In Galatians chapter five, verse six, it says, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but faith which works through love. Guys, now I want you to turn over very quickly to 1 John chapter 4. We're going to read three verses in 1 John chapter 4. And I want to encourage you, when we were in Bible college, we had to read, um, in an eight-week period, we had to read 1, 2, and 3 John several times. I believe it was once a day. And I want to encourage you to grab the Bible and read 1 John every day for weeks. There's so much in 1 John that will open up to you uh, concerning the love walk that you will not be able to comprehend it just in one or two times. So read 1 John uh, every day, the whole book. It's only five chapters. Read the whole thing every single day for the next 30 days. Look at verse 8, 1 John 4, 8. It says, He that loveth, hello? He that loveth not, knoweth not God. God is love. Say that with me. God is love. God does not have love. God is love. God is love. Amen? Verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Amen. Verse 16. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. Amen. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in love. And the one scripture tells us, we're not going to look it up, but it says we know that we pass from death to life because we love the brethren. And so we need to study this thing called love a lot. If we want to walk in health and longevity and prosperity, if we want our faith to work and change circumstances, we've got to learn to walk in love. Love doesn't mean it's always comfortable. Love loves the unlovely. What good is it if you just love people that treat you nice? The Bible says you've got to treat everyone alike, even the unlovely, people that don't treat you good, people that badmouth you, people that abuse you. We need to learn to love with this God kind of love because love is going to change people. You see, we're not responsible for, I'm not responsible for you loving me. I'm only responsible for me loving you. And so, yeah, but pastor, well, you don't know what that person treats me like. Well, you're not responsible for that. Well, yeah, but they always badmouth me and they criticize me and they abuse me. I don't want to go over and talk to that person. I don't want to be nice to them. You don't know what they're going to say to me. That doesn't matter. And that's hard for us. We, we don't want to set ourselves up to be badmouth, do we? But nevertheless, if we're going to walk in this God kind of love and we're going to stay healthy and prosperous... We've got to trust that God knows what he's talking about. Faith works by love. Can I have an amen? amen? You see, God is love, and we need to trust that love. Like Christopher was talking about this morning, we need to trust that God knows how to get us financially blessed. God is not trying to find ways to take from you. Religion teaches you that God's mad at you and he's up there with a big fly swatter ready to beat you down when you miss it. That's not God. We know God through Jesus Christ. Jesus is our example. 
Jesus is looking for ways to bless us. Can I have an amen? amen. You've got to get this uh, in your thinking. Love is trying to figure out some way to get you blessed. Love is trying to figure out how you can be blessed, not how he can punish you. Amen. Amen. If love does not work one way to get you the blessing, he's trying to figure out another way to get it to you. Right. Amen. Amen. He's not trying to punish us. In the Bible, in the New Testament, there are at least, at least seven different ways in the New Testament that God can use to get you healed in your body. At least seven different ways. He's not trying to make you sick. He's trying to get you healed. He's not trying to kill you to punish you. He's trying to get you to live long and prosper. He's not trying to be mean to you. Religion treats you like God has everything against you. He's mad at you. And if you ever walk in the church door, the building's going to collapse. Because you know what an ugly thing you were. No. You've got to understand the dispensation or the time that we live in. This is the time of the church. When Jesus died on the cross and rose again, a new dispensation or a new time started. It was no longer a time of law. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. That day is done. We're in the dispensation now of God's love being poured out upon us. Amen. This kind of love that I'm talking about has an overwhelming desire to treat us as if sin never happened. Amen. That's right. Now the Ten Commandments are our tutor. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery. Those things are our tutor that tell us give us the guidelines that we should not do those things, but it's trying to lead us to the Lord. We know when we, when we do things that, well, we know we, we shouldn't rob banks, we shouldn't steal, we shouldn't kill people. How do you know that? Because those Ten Commandments are on the inside of you. You just know right and wrong. You know it when you do it, but you do it anyway. But you see, God is not trying to punish you because you did those things. He's trying to get you uh, redeemed as if it never happened in the first place. Amen. So he's trying to figure out ways to get you into Jesus Christ, into that forgiveness, so that you don't remember your past. He doesn't remember your past. Once you give your life to him, he does not remember your past. Amen. Men will never let you forget it. But God won't bring it up to you. Amen. Hallelujah. Love is not looking for a way to keep you from being blessed. He's trying to bless you. He's trying to give you a full, complete, overwhelming life. Full of joy. Amen. But we've got to trust that love knows what it's doing. God knows what he's doing. How many of you believe and would say, Pastor, I know that God is my creator and God made me. How many of you would say that? How many of you would believe that you've got a manual that tells you how to live? Then why not go by the manual? We've got to trust his love. And you know what? We've been hurt by people. All of us in here, we've been hurt by people. I've been hurt by church people. Hello? Hello? But I don't come to church because I trust that I'm never going to get hurt. I come to, people, come to church because I love the Lord and I'm learning to love people. I'm even, I'm even learning to love Renee. I mean, I know it's difficult, but I'm learning. How can you not love Renee? Now, Sonny, that's a different story. Vicky, that's a different story. <laughs> Amen, right, Sonny? But we have to learn to walk in this thing called love. And it starts at home. It starts at home. And, and actually, I told a person this, you need to learn to love the people you work with. You're with them longer than you're with the person at home. Amen. <laughs> Until you retire. 
<laughs> I better start preaching this myself. You guys better leave it alone. You. <laughs> Jesus has given us an example. Amen? Amen. He's not being mean to us. He's trying to get me blessed. Turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 28. He's trying to get us blessed. But yet there are so many people that are missing out on their blessing because they're not following the instruction manual. Hello? I heard Pastor Dorothy talking to somebody the other day about her car, that she misses out on some of the blessing because she doesn't know how to use the car. This car is wild. You see, she, uh, well, she's got her car here this morning. It's a Chrysler 200. And this car, I actually, I don't know how to use it. I don't know how to do it. But when the salesman was showing us this car, we had it in the parking lot, and I pulled in the parking lot, and he said, take your hands off the wheel, stop the car, take your hands off the wheel, and push that button. And so I took my hands off the wheel, pushed that button, he said, now, take your foot off the brake, and let the car go. And the car just started going through the parking lot, and when the car found an empty parking spot, it backed into it. Crazy. He said, now that will work if you go downtown where they still parallel park. He said, pull up next to a vehicle if you find an empty spot. Pull up next to the vehicle. Take your hands off the wheel. Push that button and the car will park itself in that empty spot. It's wild. You've got to learn to trust that, let me tell you. Now, I don't know if you've seen this, but there's a prototype. Audi has a prototype. If you have an iPhone or a smartphone, this Audi that they've experimented with, I believe it's on the market now, uh, you pull up to a shopping mall, and you women will like this. You pull up to the shopping mall, you get out of the car, get your iPhone on there, and this Audi will go through the parking lot and go up and park itself while you go shop. When you come out, you get your iPhone out and you call the car and the car will start itself and come down and pick you up at the front door. Amen. Talk about technology. Wow. We're missing a lot of the blessings of God because we don't trust the manual. Pastor Dorothy does not trust that that car will park itself. I mean, this car, this, she had to hit this one button because when she first got the car, she was going down the road and she got too close to another vehicle and it slammed on the brakes. She says, I need to deactivate that. It scared me. So she deactivated that. Well, one day she took my truck and went to Tulsa and left me with her car. This car that she has, when you set it, it, it has things on indicators on the mirrors that if you try to switch lanes and there's a vehicle next to you in your blind spot, it will come on red and it won't let you change the lanes. It has a, 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 a detector in it of some sort that if you try to go too close to the center line, it'll pull you back over. If you go too close to the side of the road, it'll pull you back over. So I'm going to be a smart guy, right? Well, if this car is so smart, I just won't drive it. I just sat there, pushed the gas, and crossed my arms. I went about a quarter of a mile and the dashboard lit up and said, put your hands on the steering wheel. <laughs> Make up your mind. Do you want to drive or do you want me to drive? Yeah. I said all of that to say this. We need to trust the manual that the Lord knows what he's talking about. He made us and he knows how to bless us if we will trust him. One of the hardest things that the Lord has to do is to get people to trust them with their money. You see, it got real quiet in here. I had one weak amen over here. <laughs> Deuteronomy 28.1, watch this. It shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord thy God, and observe to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, 
that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And then he goes on to tell you, you'll be blessed at everything you put your hands to if you obey his commandments. Now, right away, you might be thinking of the Ten Commandments, but just stay with me. Look at verse 15. You see, he wants to bless you if you'll do what he says to do. But if you don't do what he says to do, then you're operating under the curse. Verse 15 says, but if it will come to pass, if you'll not hearken to the voice of the Lord your God to observe to do all his commandments, his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. So you have to decide, do you want to trust the Lord to walk in his blessing, or do you want to not trust him, do it your own way, and walk in the curse? Wow, you've got to trust his love. This is a big step of faith, to trust him. Amen? Amen? Love fulfills the law. Turn to Galatians chapter 5, look at verse 13. You see, we live in a new commandment now. The new commandment, we'll look at it in a little bit. You don't have to operate under the Ten Commandments. The new commandments are this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's the new commandment, the commandments of love. He said, if you walk in these commandments of love, you fulfill all the other laws. Amen. Amen. Y'all don't like this love message, do you? Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 says, For you, brethren, is that you? Have been called to liberty. You're called to freedom. When you walk in this love, you're free. I'm free to love you because it doesn't matter how you respond to that. I'm not going to get my feelings hurt. Somebody came up to me one day and they said, Pastor, I owe you an apology because of something I did or said. And I said, hey, you didn't hurt my feelings. I don't get my feelings hurt. Why? Because I'm walking in love. I'm not responsible for the way you treat me. I'm not responsible for the way Pastor Dorothy treats me. I'm only responsible for the way I treat her. And if I operate in love and I keep this royal command of love, then you know what? He said it's going to work out. But you know what? Sometimes that's challenging to do. Amen. He said, only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. All of the law is fulfilled in one word, even this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, but if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. So if I bite and devour and criticize and badmouth people and I'm walking out of love then what am I walking under? Am I walking under the blessing or the curse? Talk to me. The curse. Where do you want to walk? The blessing or the curse? I want to walk in the blessing, so then I'm going to walk over here on this side. I'm going to walk in this love walk. Hello. And if I miss it, I'm going to repent, and I'm going to go on. Hello. Romans chapter 13, verse 8 through verse 10. It says, Owe no one anything except to love one another. Romans 13, 9. There we go. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, they are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Love. Amen. So how do I know that I have this kind of love? Turn to Romans chapter 5. Look at verse 5. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Amen. God so loved the world that he gave Amen? Even when we didn't deserve it. Somebody said the other day, they said, well, I didn't deserve this blessing. Well, you didn't. Neither did I. You didn't deserve Jesus Christ, but he gave himself freely. If any of us got what we deserved, we'd all go to hell. That's right. That's what we deserved, but God made a way to bless us. 1 John chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. So you've got, how many of you are born again? 
you know the Lord Jesus, then you've got this love on the inside of you. You have to develop it. You have to learn to yield to it. 1 John 3, 14. We know that we've passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderers have eternal life abiding in them. Amen. Say amen or oh me. Amen. Look at chapter 5. Look at verse 1. Whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him who is begotten also loves him who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. I didn't say they weren't challenging, but they're not burdensome. They come with a blessing. Turn to Matthew chapter 22. I'm giving you a lot of scripture here this morning. Say this out loud with me. God so loved that he gave. He gave his best. You see... If you're not a giving person, if you don't learn to give, I just wonder what's in your heart. Is it in your heart? You need to develop that. I've heard Christian people talk about Christmas. Well, Christmas is just commercialized, and I don't believe in all of that. Listen, guys, you should be living in Christmas every day of the year. Amen. You should be willing to give at any point the Lord tells you to give. Amen. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Well, I don't understand that, Pastor. Well, you just try it. Try being a giving person. Amen. Matthew chapter 22, verse 36 says, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your uh, soul. This is the first commandment and the great one. The second one is like, it's, like it also. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. All of it. You see, listen guys, love is the curtain rod. And every other commandment there is hangs on that curtain rod. Because if I love you, I'm not going to steal from you. If I love you, I'm not going to cheat you. If I love you, I'm not going to covet from you. If I love you, I'm not going to kill you. Hello. That's right. Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. He gives us an example. He said, therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. This is the law and the prophets. So how do I walk in this lo love walk, pastor? Well, just treat people the way you want to be treated. You want people to gossip about you? You want people to badmouth you? You want people to talk about you? Not really. You don't want that, do you? I mean, you, we all want to be accepted, right? We all want to be loved and appreciated, right? Amen. And so we need to talk nice with, about one another. I heard a story years ago about a, a small community where there was an old contentious man that lived in this community. He hated everybody, talked bad about everybody, didn't have anything nice to say about anybody. But at the same time, there was this other man that walked in love. He just loved everybody. He said nice things about everybody. He couldn't find anything bad about anybody. Well, one day this old uh, guy died, this rotten individual died, and people were glad when he died. They all lined up for his funeral. They wanted to make sure he was dead and lined up in his casket. And they were all at the funeral home, and they waited for this loving, sweet guy to come in, and they wanted to see what he'd have to say about this guy that died. They walk, he walked over to the casket, and he looked in the casket, and they were all gathered around him. They couldn't wait to hear what he had to say about this rotten individual that finally met his maker. And he just turned around. He said, she sure has nice teeth, doesn't he? You see, you need to find something good about people. Amen? Amen. There's good in every one of us. Amen? Something good. But we need to find those things and look for those things and concentrate on those things. Can I have an amen? amen? You see, love is an action. Love is something that we do. If you say you love somebody and you're not a giving person to them or you don't show appreciation to them, you're not acting on what you believe. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4 and look at verse 32. How do I demonstrate this love, Pastor? 
Verse 32, he says, Be kind one to another. Be kind one to another. Tender hearted. Forgiving one another. Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. I just wonder what kind of person you really are if you don't forgive somebody. You see, the Bible tells us that we need to be careful about that because with what judgment we judge others, it'll happen to us. Anything that you can think of that has happened to anybody could happen to you. It could have been you. Hello? It could have. And it still could. Because at any given moment, any one of us as human beings are vulnerable. But you've got to stay strong in the love of God. To stay powerful in the things of God. And not judge other people. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 2 says, walk in love as Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. You see the attitude of the Lord? He's giving. He's giving. He's a giving God. Amen? But sometimes the way that we were raised and the different uh, upbringings that we have, the different cultures, the different environment, we weren't taught that. Sometimes you're taught to be stingy. Actually, you have to be taught to be a giving person. You can see it in two little boys. You put two little boys in one little room with one ball and find out who's a giver. No, you have to teach them that. Share. Teach one another that. I was raised in a family that, you know, when I was raised up as a baby boomer in the 50s, we didn't have a lot. Post-war people didn't have a lot. They were coming out of recession, coming out of lack, coming out of not far from the depression. And so we were used to not having a lot. And if you had it, you needed to keep it or you didn't know when you were going to get it again. And so we were taught to hang on to it. We weren't taught to give. That was embedded into me. And so when I grew up, I thought, man, when I have something, uh, I need to hang on to it. And then I met Pastor Dorothy, who was raised in a different type of family. Her dad was uh, in World War II, but her dad, had, her dad lost his parents when he was a very young boy. And he was raised in an orphanage. And in this orphanage, the way it affected him, he said, when I grow up, when I get to be a father, my children are never going to do without. I, they're never going to do without. I didn't have anything in the orphanage. When I have a family, they're never going to do without. And so guys, over here on this side of the pendulum, at Christmas time, he would take every credit card he had, he would do everything he could to give all five of those kids whatever they wanted. I mean, I don't, I don't think I ever met such a person that would give as much as her father gave. And I didn't understand that. Now, I met Pastor Dorothy in July of 1966. We were married in October of 1966. And I met her family, and at the Christmas, the first Christmas that we had together in her family, they had bought me as much as they bought her brothers. They didn't even know me. But now I'm part of the family, and they're going to treat me just like they treated one of their sons. It brought me to tears. I couldn't believe it. I had never been treated like that. And then Pastor Dorothy took that and brought that over into our marriage. You know, I was working. I was still in high school, and, and I was working and made very little money. And at Christmas time the following year, uh, I think my paycheck was under $100, I think $110 a week. Uh, you know, we had a, a mobile home payment we had to pay. I had a car payment. We had insurances. I mean, we had to count the pennies and the nickels. I mean, groceries were $10 a week. And that was a different meat every night of the week. And Pastor Dorothy smoked at that time. That included a pack or a carton of cigarettes, $10 a week. But our propane gas was $2.50. That only lasted for two weeks to heat our mobile home. 
we had to count the pennies. But at Christmas time, Pastor Dorothy wants to buy everybody something. That's the way she was raised. I wasn't raised that way. I was raised, if you don't have the money, you don't get nothing for Christmas. The bills come first. The food comes first. That's the way I was raised. You might or might not. We, my dad always ended up getting us something, but it might not be much. So we were raised from two different families. I wasn't taught to give. She wasn't taught to save. <laughs> But I remember, you know, we went, she, we worked at, she worked at a gas station, and behind this gas station was an old man that lived by himself in this little shack. And she took, in my thinking, it may not have been this way, but in my thinking, she took the last $10 we had and went and bought him a pair of slippers. I mean, we, I fussed about it. I told her about it. Are you crazy? See, you can't just give to everybody. Well, why not? And she made gifts for everybody. So we had, she had to teach me how to be a giver. And I really didn't learn that until I got into the things of the Lord. And now I know what it's like. I know, I know what she meant. I was taught that. You all know what I'm talking about? Anybody raised that way where you were taught just to hang on to it? It was hard for me to tithe. Are you serious? I was told for years to tithe. My grandmother I said, I can't afford to. She said, you can't afford not to. But then when Pastor Dorothy started tithing, oh man, I threatened her with it. She said, well, the Bible says to prove the Lord in that. I said, well, it better be right. You better be right about this. And she did it. And we've been doing it ever since. Guys, the Lord knows what he's talking about. Can I have an amen? He says... Walk in love. Amen. Look at verse, chapter 5, verse 25. We're about ready to close with this. Y'all bored so far? Nope. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. Even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Hello. That was not easy for me to do. Because I was raised with the selfishness. And so to trust that Pastor Dorothy would let me love her, that meant I've got to trust her with my life. And I didn't. I didn't trust her. So when it, I, was a, I was a hunter and a fisherman. And when it came time to go hunting, I never asked her. I just told her, hey, I'm going hunting. Why? Because I figured if I ask her, she's going to say No. You can't have the money to go hunting. You know, you can't do that. So I never told her. Or I mean, I never asked her. I just told her. I'm loading the camper. I'm loading my guns. I'm loading my food. I'm going for a week up north. And don't try to contact me. If they find me dead in the woods, the police will let you know. And she tried every trick in the book to keep me from going hunting. And even one year she said, I'm so sick, I'm going to end up in the hospital, don't go hunting. I said, hey, don't pull that trick on me, I'm going hunting. When I got back, I found out she ended up really, really sick. But that was a long time in the things of God before I would trust her with that. Amen. And then she trusted my love enough to where I wouldn't just take off and leave her empty-handed. Amen. Hello. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Mm, that's hard. Oh, man, I don't want to do that. But I found out, you know, that in our lives, that if I give to her, she's not going to take advantage of that. If I show her that I love her, I mean, she, now she, does, she, she, she knows that I'm going to give. I was, I was told yesterday... I think it was yesterday. I have an iPhone. I think it's an i4 or i5. Is it what, how, what are they, eights now? Yeah. Tens? Pastor Dorothy, I think, has a seven or an eight. And she looked at her phone yesterday. She says, oh, I'm going to go get a ten and give you mine. <laughs> We're not going to get two tens. She's going to get the ten and I'm going to get hers. <laughs> because she knows that's the way I would do it anyway. 
I've always done that with cars. If we go buy a new car, I'll take the, give her the newest one, and I'll take the next one. But that wasn't always the way it was, guys. But you know what? She treats me good. She doesn't take advantage of that. Amen? She's, I've learned this, that I, I, she, if Pastor Dorothy tells me she wants something, she knows that I'm going to work it out somehow. It might take me a couple years, but I'll work it out. I, amen? Right now she's working on a BMW. <laughs> So, guess what, guys? God will work it out for her. All right, watch this. John 15, 13, we'll close with this. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. In closing, let me give you a couple of illustrations here. When I was learning to walk in this God kind of love and I was learning to give, it was very challenging for me because I still gave Y'all listening or you want to go home? I gave with strings attached to it. It took me a while to learn this. And it was through walking in love that God told me, if you're giving and there's strings attached to it, then you're really not giving. Uh, if, I gave, if I sent Pastor Dorothy flowers, I expected, uh, you know, oh yeah, that's really good, honey. I expected love and drool and all kinds of stuff, you know special attention. Well, that's not giving. No. Uh, I, get, I think it was on our <clears throat> 13th wedding anniversary, I bought her a very special ring. It had 13 diamonds in it, and it was awesome. And I was so proud of that ring, and I gave it to her, you know. And that was really cool. That was it with strings attached. You know. We're all adults here, right? Amen. Special favors, you know. You know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> and that happened. She knew how to favor me because she was really appreciative. But then we got over into the things of God and we started learning to give. And she came to me one day and she said, the Lord told me to give that ring to this woman. Oh, man. You're serious? I bought you that ring. Thirteen diamonds in that thing, and God's telling you to give it away? Ugh, that hurt. That meant there was still conditions on that ring. But she gave it to that woman. What a blessing that was. I remember Pastor Jason, I gave him my first rifle that I bought uh, to go deer hunting. I, it, it, I saved a lot of money for it. It cost me $70. And when he got old enough, I gave him the rifle. It, it, it was my keepsake. And uh, we went to church, and Pastor Jason, he was about 10 or 11 years old, and he said, the Lord told me to give that rifle to the pastor. <laughs> oh, I get, I, that's my rifle. I bought that when I was 12 years old, and you're going to give it to the preacher? <laughs> I said, yeah, go ahead. Then the pastor sold it and bought a camera. Oh, my God. Testing my love walk, man. This was my rifle. My kid gave it away, and the pastor sold it and bought a camera. Didn't mean anything to anybody. Give it back to me. It meant something to me. When I first started prospering when we were younger, uh, it was back in like the 73 or 74, I remember the first big commission check I got from a job that I sold. I went and bought Pastor Dorothy a, a Kirby vacuum cleaner, and I bought Pastor Jason a Schwinn bicycle. It had all the bells and whistles and all that stuff on it. Awesome bicycle. I mean, this was big stuff. We got over into the things of the Lord, and there was a little kid that lived around the corner from us at the resort, and Pastor Jason came and says, I said, where's your bicycle? He said, well, the Lord told me to give it to that boy around the corner. I said, God, <laughs> why are you guys giving all this stuff away that I bought you guys with my blood, sweat, and tears? And the Lord was teaching me. He was teaching me. You had strings attached to all that stuff. You're so materialistic that it meant more to you than anything. And so I had to learn to let it go. I had to learn to let it go.
Amen. Amen. But back in the back in the seventies, they made uh, this Lincoln Continental Mark. I guess it would have been a Mark Eight back then. I don't know. Buddy would know more than me. And I loved that car. Man, those were those things were as long as submarines. They had hoods on them that you you needed binoculars to see to the end of the thing. And I wanted one of those cars really bad. We got over into the things of God. And uh, uh, the, I got to make this really sh short story. And I, I wanted one of those cars ever since they were brand new. Now we're in the 80s, and it's probably 1985. And the car's old by now, but still, I love that car. Well, God blessed me. He gave me the desires of my heart. And I, somebody bought me one of those cars and gave it to me. It had three different colors on it. It was a Givenchy series. It had gold-plated windows on it. Man, I love that car. Ooh, I finally got it. When I pulled up in church, we still got pictures of it. When I pulled it up in front of church, it took up 42 parking spots. It was so big. <laughs> Man, I was proud of that car. It had the automatic lights on it. It had the sunroof and the three-tone paint on it. It was gorgeous. One day, we were behind in the rent on the church, and I'm praying in my bedroom. We didn't have an office back then. I was praying in the bedroom. I said, Lord, what am I going to do? Where am I going to get the money to pay for the note on the church? I don't know why I always took it on myself, but that's the way Pastor and I do it. You know, we always take care of the church's stuff first. And so I'm praying there, and all of a sudden, it was on a Saturday morning at about 11 o'clock, and the Lord said, I want you to take that car and go give it to this guy. Oh, no, are you kidding me? I believed for that car for 12 years. I wanted it, and you're telling me to give that car away? So I just ignored it. Get behind me, Satan. <laughs> Kept studying, preparing for Sunday. Then all of a sudden, it came up on the inside of him again. I want you to take that car and go give it to this person. So I went and grabbed Pastor Dorothy. I said, you ready to go with me? I said, we've got to go. We've got to give this car to somebody. We got in the car, drove it over to him. She followed me. Drove it over to the guy, knocked on the door, and I said, the Lord told me to give you this car. I gave him the keys and the title and walked away. Whew. That was a big deal, guys. Mm -hmm. Giving without strings attached. Because we're just stewards of it. Amen. But God was able to bless us. We were able to make the note, make the payment. Hallelujah. Why? Because you've got to trust God's love. Amen. Amen. Stand on your feet, everybody. You've got to trust the love of God. And guys, it's a, it's a learning experience. Amen. Christopher has experienced the love of God. He was raised in church. It's hard to believe that he was the little kid in diapers that used to terrorize and tear the church half apart when he was here. <laughs> and the Christmas tree. Yeah, he would tear it. Tear it apart. Amen. But we're still blessed to have him here. But he learned and still has to practice it. Even just a few weeks ago, he had the money. Well, the $80 he had in his pocket wasn't enough to buy a car, was it? I'm not going to let you all go until you say something. Don't meet the need, it must be seen. That's right. I know. That was just you and Sonny, though. The rest of the people can talk. <laughs> Ken, what did you say? If it don't meet the need, it must be seen. There you go. Did you all hear that? Yes. And that's, the, that's a principle to live by. Mm -hmm. Amen. Say, I love Vicki. <laughs> I love Sonny. They're a real blessing. You know, they moved here specifically for this church. Amen. 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 What a blessing, sweetheart. Amen. Y'all ready to go home? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Got to go to, gotta go to do you? Yeah. Come here, and Pastor Dorothy and I are going to pray with you. Huh? Sonny, come on up here. We're not going to tell you guys what this is all about, but they have to go to Texas. This is private. But we're just going to pronounce blessings upon you. I just believe, Father, in the name of Jesus, for a safe trip, and not just for a safe trip, but for a prosperous trip, yes. Father. That, Father, you said you'd work all things together for good for those that love God and are called according to your purpose. And so we thank you, Father God, that this trip is blessed of you and that you open a door where there doesn't seem to be a way. And you made a way, Father God, and we count it done in Jesus' name.
Amen. 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 Now, give to Vicki and let her drive. Uh-uh. <laughs> no. Vicki's back, does not want to drive. <laughs> uh, we'll see you guys, all right? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we just thank you, Lord, that Jesus, you are our example. And Lord, that you teach us to give and teach us to give without strings being attached because Jesus is the ultimate giver. Amen. Come join us at New Beginnings Family Church, located in Mustang, Oklahoma, at 1615 East State Highway 152. You can find us online on Facebook and YouTube or at walkbyfaith.info. To contact us, call 405-261-6887. And remember, you don't need a second chance. You need a new beginning.